Well, praise the Lord, we're ready to go into the word of God. Let's just pause and go before the mercy seat and throne of God together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you because we still have a praise that after all we have suffered, after all that we have sinned, God, you've yet allowed a remnant of your spirit to abide in us. And we thank you, God, that we have a yet praise that with tears in our eyes, we shall yet praise you. With broken hearts, we shall yet praise you. With dreams unrealized, we shall yet praise you because your credit is good with us. God, I pray that by your word and by your spirit, you might come near to us, that we might hear your voice, that we might sup from your table and drink from your fountain, that your healing balm might bind up our wounds, and that we might mark, march forward in the strength of your spirit. Now speak. Your servants are listening. How you choose to move, we'll be careful to give you the credit. We'll say that Jesus did it, for we ask these blessings in his mighty name. It's in Jesus' name that we want to say thank you. And all God's children said, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I am excited because on this first Sunday, the month of November, October, we are beginning a new series of sermons called The World at War. And I want to just go ahead and get into the word of God right now. Meet me in Matthew's Gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning reading at the first verse, Matthew's Gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning reading at the first verse, and there these words are recorded. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. As the Spirit does speak and God does God, I just want to use as a sermonic subject to launch this World at War series, I want to use as a subject for today, taking the fight to the enemy. Taking the fight to the enemy. Amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we are at war. You feel it, don't you? Personally, nationally, ethnically, economically, militarily, spiritually. You feel it, don't you? To be alive is to be in constant conflict. We feel it in our politics, in the comment section of every post on social media, underlying every everyday interaction with strangers and with friends. You feel it, don't you? I mean, it seems as if our species has decided to develop new and more efficient ways to tear ourselves apart. I mean, hospital workers being attacked for trying to save lives. Hostility just seems to live under the surface of every casual conversation and sinister intent seems to lurk behind every smile. You know it intellectually, you feel it emotionally, you sense it spiritually. Y'all, we are a world at war. And, uh, and the truth is every day you wake up, there's a sense that you're almost in the battle for your very life. 
We certainly know we're in the battle for the soul of our country. We know every day we have to fight for the fate of our families and even for the future of the church. Y'all, we are a world at war. And listen to me, that this war, as we know from the Bible, is not against flesh and blood. But the truth of the matter is, the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness often operate through human hosts. You ever have a conversation and have the sense that you and that other person are not the only people in the room? <laughs> that there is a spiritual dynamic at play. There are words that are audible, but there is a spiritual encounter that leaves you drained or, or on the defensive because you recognize that this person does not mean you any good. All I'm trying to get at, brothers and sisters, hold right there, is, is that we've got to recognize and realize the kind of battle that we're in. And, and the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, we, we do not do ourselves a, a, a service as Christians to live in a defeatist posture. I mean, think about it. As kingdom believers, as soon as we start talking about spiritual warfare, the assumption of the conversation is defense. Come on, here's a child, you know the devil's busy. He's attacking me, I, I, he's coming after my stuff. He's coming, and, and the truth of the matter is we know the devil's a roaring lion seeking whom he shall devour. But what is a lion to a hunter? Has it ever occurred to you that we got this spiritual warfare thing backwards. That rather than living our lives on the defense, God has called us as kingdom believers to take the offense. Now, in order to catch this concept, you have to make a decision. You have to decide whether you're going to stand with the Christ that the culture has created. You know, the weak Pollyannish flower child Jesus, that's a victim. Now understand that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not an instance of victimization, it was an instance of sacrifice. You see, crucifixion was not a result of his passivity or his inability to defend himself. We know if he wanted to, he could have called down 10,000 angels to rescue him from that place. So when you look to the cross, don't look at someone who was defeated. Look at somebody who decided to die as the ultimate act of heroism, as the ultimate example of courage and sacrifice. Maybe instead of just calling him the wounded healer, we should refer to him as who he is, the mighty warrior. I'm going to try it again. You cannot win this war running. We know in, in World War II, the Battle of Dunkirk, when the British uh, Army found itself hemmed in uh, between the English Channel and the Germans that had outmaneuvered them and outnumbered them. And it was at that point uh, that, that the British government called not simply every vessel that could sail on the water in the Navy, but also every private vessel that could make the trip to go and rescue their troops, yet they, lest they all be destroyed. And by some kind of minor miracle, most of the army was saved. But just as soon as they got back on the shore and the people rightfully celebrated, Winston Churchill, who was prime minister, said this to the nation. He said, as great as this miracle is, the truth of the matter is wars are not won by retreat. And, and, and just think about it, you've been in church a while, how many retreats have you been on? <laughs> now let me ask this question. How many advances have you been on? I want to declare today it's time to take the fight to the enemy because that's what Jesus has called us to do. He says the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent what? 
take it by force. I, I've shared with you before that when Jesus declared the church to be his, declaring upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That was a call to war. He says the kingdom of that, that the church, that the, that the kingdom of, of devil is going to be defeated. Why? Because the gates of hell shall not prevail. That means that there has been an attack on the kingdom of Satan and the gates that he's been using to try to defend himself are now coming down. The only way the gates fall, the only way the gates can't stand anymore is because there is an assault against the gate that's coming from the church. Have you ever considered that the church is more than just sanctuary? It's the armory. It's where we come to get equipped and get ready to fight for our faith and fight for our family and fight for our future. It's, it's the army. Somebody shout the armory. I mean, after all, I mean, we, and, and don't get me wrong, it is the sanctuary, it's the place where the righteous can run in and find shelter, but we ain't supposed to stay in. In a battle, you fall back so you can regroup and rearm so then you can go back out and get the victory. Somebody needs to leave the sanctuary fully armed. And we know the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. You got them. You just got to use them. Okay. Okay. What I'm trying to get you to see, soldier, is that the worst place in a battle to be is in what's called no man's land. When, when armies have arrayed themselves and, and they've drawn themselves in a line, the, the, the place you don't want to be is in the middle. That's called no man's land. Because in no man's land, you have no army to support you. And the truth of the matter is, as long as you're a believer who lives on the defensive, you live in no man's land. It's time for us to recognize that Jesus saved us, that we might serve as soldiers in the army of the Lord. Y'all gave me that slow clap. I've been doing this a long time. It seemed like the right thing to do, but y'all ain't convinced. That's all right. I came prepared. I'm a professional, but doing this a long time. Let's go to the Bible. I'll show you the war cry of God. Matthew's gospel, the 10th chapter, begins with Jesus sending his 12 apostles upon their first ministry mission. Somebody shout mission. He, he's sending them out. To, to go and declare the kingdom of heaven. That, that's their mission. And understand this, watch this. Until you understand your mission, you cannot think to have victory. If you don't know your mission, how will you know what you're fighting for? Hold right there. If you don't know your mission, how do you know who you're supposed to fight, where you're supposed to fight, and if you've won? So you cannot live as a missionless believer. Go down a little bit that, that other way. That you have to get to the point, brothers and sisters, where you recognize that Jesus in sending his disciples is sending them out, hold on, is sending them out to say, listen, I'm giving you this opportunity to conquer. There's an old phrase that says, where there is land, there is war. And I don't know if you've ever read your Bible and you have to read much, just read the first couple chapters of Genesis. You'll discover the war cry actually starts there because as soon as God creates man, God then gives him his mission. What's his mission? To subdue the earth and exercise what? Dominion. Dominion. Hmm. Kingdom. The domain of the king. So as a kingdom believer, I operate under the authority of the king and the king's domain. And as God created me in the beginning, God gave me the authority to exercise dominion over the earth. That happens in Genesis one and two. The devil don't show up till Genesis three. 
the kingdom passed the first lick. We were called, we were made to be on the offense, but we have a defensive mindset. But we're going to crush that tonight in the name of Jesus. We're going to put the devil under our feet. So, so your victory starts off by understanding your mission. And, and brothers and sisters, you're, 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 when I say your mission, the mission to establish the kingdom of God, you instantly, you won't say it because you don't want to lose your church credentials. But as soon as I talk talking about establishing the kingdom of God and being a witness and bringing other people to the kingdom, you 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 automatically tune me off. Because if we're honest, we all live in narcissistic insularity. We're into ourselves and off to ourselves. We, we live in this self-absorbed society where we really only come to the word to hear how it can benefit us. Because we say to ourselves, well, listen, I'm not trying to be selfish, but I just got some issues. And, and, and if God can help me with my problems, then I'll be ready to do his assignment and to fulfill his calling. Here's the problem with that. I told you a couple weeks ago, there's no such thing as a pain free life. So the only way I can get past my pain is to look past my pain. To a purpose that's greater than my pain. OK, OK. Um, <laughs> So uh, years ago, uh, I'm on this boat. This is a boat. You know it because I told you. <laughs> so I'm on this boat and uh, ta-da. And um, the waves are, you know, kind of choppy and I'm not feeling good. I'm, I'm a little seasick. And you know, I'm trying to man up, so I'm turning green, but I'm trying to be you know, cool. And the captain looks at me. You feeling all right? Nah, I'm not. <laughs> he said, your problem is you're looking in the wrong place. He said, you keep looking at the water. You keep looking around the boat. He said, but all that stuff is moving. He said, lift up your eyes and keep focusing on the horizon. The horizon is still, the horizon is static, and it will allow you to get your equilibrium back. You keep waiting for God to settle the water. You keep waiting for God to fix what's wrong with the boat. God is saying, if you look to my mission and my purpose, I will give you what you need to handle whatever's not settled. Y'all didn't hear that last part. See, we only shout on the peace be still passage, but God is not obligated to still my storm in order for me to move forward in victory. And the best way to look forward in victory and achieve my victory is to look past my pain to my purpose. Once I understand my mission is to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. My mission is to serve as God's representative wherever I am on my job in the street that when people see me, they're supposed to see Jesus, which means I got to have something on the inside for them to see. Once I understand that, all my focus stops being on my bills and you've had bills long enough, they ain't going nowhere. Okay, okay. Think about it. Bible says he sent his 12 apostles, right? Now, what do we know about these guys? These guys had to leave their homes and their families and their jobs to follow Jesus, which means the only way they leave their responsibilities is they look past their problems to their purpose. Okay, don't you think out of 12 men, somebody's wife may have been pregnant? And he left anyway. Don't you think leaving? Now, it's one thing to leave for your job. It's another thing to leave to follow some guy that don't nobody know. Huh? Out of 12 guys, you don't think somebody had bills that had mounted up? And he left anyway. Out of 12 guys, you don't think somebody's child was sick when he walked out the door? But we don't call their names unless they look past their current problems to the purpose for which God has called them. 
Their names are in the book because they decided to go forward the mission. Can I ask a question? Is your name going to make the book? I mean, any book. Watch this. Watch this. Bible says they move forward in mission. Here's the problem. We try to get deep as church folks. Well, you know, I'm still trying to pray on my purpose. You know, I'm, pray I'm in a season of prayer. You're in a season of something, but it ain't prayer. You're in a pre season of stall. Here's what I know. Everybody Jesus called was already doing something when he called them. So when it comes to doing what God has called you to do, do something and he will redirect you. And you remember physics, you remember that inertia that when it, an object is that still, you have to exert more force to move it. If it's already moving, it's easier to redirect it. Even if you had to move it in the wrong, the opposite direction, it will bounce back. Here, here, here's, watch this, watch this. I don't know your name, I don't know your age, I don't know where you're from, but I know your calling. You ready? You never get to say, I don't know my calling, but you ready? You're called to worship. You're called to be a witness, to evangelize. You're called to serve and to use your gifts to be a blessing to somebody else. You're called to be a good steward and to use the resources God has given you to build up his kingdom in his church. You're called to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow him, to take up your cross and follow him. I just gave you five points of your mission. You don't ever say again, I don't know my calling. And what I just told you is enough to keep you busy for the rest of your life. Preach, Reverend. Watch this. All I'm trying to get you to see, brothers and sisters, is that these guys are on a mission. The Bible says Jesus sends these 12 apostles out. Watch this. And he gives them the message. Here's the message. I, I, I told you they're on a mission. And the mission requires that they bring the message. What's the message? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom, Told you what the kingdom is. It's the domain of the king. The kingdom of heaven is when? Now. It's at hand. It's available right now. Now, let me ask you this question. You hit the number. Don't, get, don't act like you don't know. <laughs> you hit the number. You, you ever see that story? Somebody, somebody got the Powerball ticket. And they have to wait like five weeks for them to show up. What did you say? Not me. You're going to be at the office the next day. Hey, hey, hey. Open the door. It's time to get paid. <laughs> Think about your sense of immediacy and urgency because you understand money. The reason we don't have a sense of urgency about the kingdom is because we don't understand mission. We don't understand the power that's available. We don't understand that souls are on the line. You've been saved 25 years, 30 years. Where, where's God's return on investment? How many people are saying, I thank God for you because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know Jesus. In other words, instead of looking at hating coworkers and classmates, they just hating on me. The question is, do they have Christ in their lives? Has God given me an open field to plant seed in that'll bring forth a harvest? But it means I gotta have the offensive mindset. Listen, the message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what's interesting is that right there, he then puts a qualifier. He says, but listen, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, that thing bothered me because that means that he's really being exclusive. He's just saying, uh, just go to the Jews. Now, that's not, actually not surprising because when we read Matthew's gospel, that really is the, 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 the focus of Matthew's gospel. That's why in the beginning, he gives you all of the lineage of Jesus going through his heritage to show his, his Judaistic background. But more importantly, Jesus is doing something else. Jesus is showing that he's keeping faith with Israel because his covenant originally started with Israel. Okay, let me give you a war phrase to help make it make sense that there's a phrase among soldiers that says, no man left behind. That that means that when we go into battle, if you fall, if you're wounded, if you're injured, or if you're in trouble, then because we're brothers and sisters in arms, I have an obligation to put myself at risk to make sure we get you back. 
So, so Jesus is saying, I made a covenant with you long time ago. And so my first obligation is to make sure that you're not left behind. Now, you see this in Jesus. And of course, it is not exclusive because even at the end of Matthew's gospel, that's when you get what we call the the uh, the great uh, commandment where he says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Somebody shout all nations. All nations. So that's now Israel and everybody else. Right. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I command you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus gives this great commission at the end to say, listen, I started with Israel, but I'm not sticking with Israel. It's Israel plus. That's why even in the ministry of Jesus, I mean, the ministry of Paul, when he goes into a new city, he always follows the same pattern. Paul always starts in the synagogue to the Jews that are there in that city and he pre presents the gospel and then he leaves the synagogue and then he goes to the marketplace. Y'all with me? Go back to the message. So watch this. So, so he's, he's there and he's proclaim, telling them to proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what I'm trying to show you is that as he's preaching, he's telling them this. He said, your assignment is to make sure that at the end of the day, in order for them to understand who I am, they have got to hear the kingdom of heaven. This is not Jesus is my life coach. Jesus is my friend. I mean, because because what we have done as we have so pacified Jesus. That we've made him like Mr. Rogers. And I'm trying to suggest to you, Jesus is more like Rambo. Uh, Leon, back in the 90s, okay, uh, there was this guy named Rambo. Y'all you, 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 millennials, y'all check it out later on, I gotta rush. So, so watch this, so watch this. So, so the, he gives them this mission, go therefore, and, and, and watch this. Then he gives them the method. In other words, Jesus says, listen, the work, he says, my kingdom is not just in word, but it's also in what? Power which means that people ain't gonna believe you just because you got a good get talk game. You're gonna have to show and prove. So the, the chapter actually begins with Jesus giving them authority, ecousia. What that means is the king gives you authority and you have the authority of the king. And so because Jesus was able to cleanse people of their sickness, Jesus was able to deliver people of their demons. Now that they're operating in Jesus's authority, now they have the capacity to do the same thing. But here's the thing. In war, here's another old war phrase, armies always fight on their bellies. You know what that means? That means that when armies are fighting and they're, and they're here, they've got to be supplied. They've got to have food and fuel and, and bullets, right? And so this army can't survive any further than its resources will allow it. It crawls and fights on its belly. If you don't feed it, if you don't keep it clothed and properly sheltered, that army is going to die. And here's the problem. For those of us who have figured out our mission and that we are supposed to be bringing the kingdom of God through this message and through his message methods of power. The problem is we don't have the power because we don't have the fuel. OK, y'all remember that time? where uh, Jesus's disciples uh, were out and this uh, father came up to Jesus mad and he said, what's going on with all the commotion? He said, yeah, listen, I brought my son to your people. I brought my son to the place where he should have been delivered. I brought him to church. I brought him to the church people. And he'd been dealing with this demon all his life. It's throwing him, it's made him stiff. It's trying to throw him in the water, trying to throw him in the fire. And guess what? They couldn't do nothing about it. Finally, Jesus delivers the young man. And after they leave his presence, the disciples are like, hey, uh, Jesus. Um, man, what went wrong? His response, this kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. In other words, just because you have the authority, you have to exercise that which is necessary to be fueled up. Little prayer, little power. No word, no warfare. That we want to have victory, but we're not doing the things that are within us to get victory. You got some demons on your job? You got some demons in your house. Well, what are you eating? When's the last time you've been to the spiritual gym? Put some work in on your knees and prayer. When's the last time you got built up in the spirit? 
for the war that is raging in our world. See, the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, it's not that the devil is so, is so strong, it's just that we just got our supply lines cut. But guess what? Your supply line is as, is as close as your next prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm gonna give you this and I'll be through. So, so the Bible says that Jesus gives them the mission. Their mission is to what? is to have dominion and to bring the kingdom of God on earth. He gives them the message, kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gives them the method, they have the power to deliver from disease and to bind demons, and then he gives them the means. This is the part I like. So he's sending them out and he says, listen, don't take nothing with you. Black version of the Bible. Um, don't take any food, don't take any extra clothes, don't take an extra staff, don't take any money. Now you're going to be traveling and you're going to travel, you're going to leave broke on purpose. Now who wants to sign up for that mission? <laughs> no, not one. Mama didn't raise no food. So God, if you want me, and I just told you about supply lines, how are you going to send me out empty handed? It's because you have to understand that God does not send with resources. He sends with resourcefulness. He says, you're not bringing rations and tents and equipment. I'm sending you with the ability to be sustained by what you find and who you are. Okay. So um, y'all know President Teddy Roosevelt, right? The, 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 the great president who was also a great uh, discoverer. So in his 50s, after having suffered many injuries, he decides he's going to lead a delegation in the forest, uh, the Amazon forest down in Brazil to go map this uncharted river. So, of course, they have all their supplies and their boats and their equipment and their tents and their clothes and their rations of food and all that kind of stuff. But as they keep going deeper and deeper into the jungle, and they get eaten up by the bugs and start coming down with disease and now start encountering rapids and encumbering, they, they have to start leaving stuff behind. And, and then one of their party goes crazy and actually kills another man on the party. And, and so now they're so deep in, they can't get out and they can't bring the stuff they brought with them. They're empty handed. All they have is what's in here. He makes it out, not because of what he brought with him, it's because of what was on the inside of him. And the promises of God is that what you lack in money and access and power and strength, I'll make up for with favor with strangers and discernment and wisdom to outmaneuver people in powerful positions. And I'll give you grace when your strength has gone out. In other words, part of my method is not just that you're going to do miracles, you're going to be a miracle. I'm going to put so much favor on your life that, that people don't know you are going to take a liking to you and people who, who should come against you are going to stand up and defend you. You're not hearing what I'm saying. That when God sends you on a mission, you got to remember you ain't out here on the battlefield by yourself. If you stand, he'll fight. If you open up your mouth, he'll give the speaking. Is there anybody here that's a witness that you found yourself with their back against the wall when you couldn't figure out, when you couldn't make your way out and somehow God made a way out of no way and he fought your battle I come to declare it's time to stop running it's time to stop crying and being scared of your own shadow it's time to stand up and go on the offense knowing that God has already given us the victory I said God has already given us the victory I know they don't play it on the radio and they don't play it on Pandora. But when I came up in church, we used to sing an old song that said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. What's his name? Y'all ain't sound like y'all about to win nothing. What's his name? Jesus, Jesus, precious. That's what praise is 
I don't fool around and got happy on my own circle. That's what praise is all about. Praise is the soldiers getting together to get out our war cry. Don't no battle happen when the soldiers walking around scared, whispering to each other. No, I want to let the enemy know you got to have a fight on your hand today. You want some? I'm bringing all the smoke with me because I know in whom I have believed. I said, and I am persuaded that he's able to do anything but fail. It's time to take the fight to the enemy. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, thank you for pulling down the stronghold of a defeated mindset. Come against the spirit of fear and worry. God, I come against the spirit of timidity, of, of, of being intimidated by what we should be intimidating. God, give us to know that you've made us to be more than conquerors and that when we go in your name, you come with us. You're a hedge all around us. God, we thank you right now for the victory that is ours in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands, clap them loud and clap them fast. Hallelujah. I want to extend to you this invitation to accept Christ as Lord and Savior of your life if you're unsaved, unsure about what it means to be saved. And today for you, my brother, today for you, my sister, is the day of salvation. There's a war going on in this world and you don't need to be in no man's land by yourself need to know that you're a part of the army of the Lord. All you need to do is enlist right now. Listen, don't worry about qualifying. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. All you need to do is accept your orders, accept your uniform, and God will welcome you on in to salvation. If you're unsaved, then reach out to the number on the screen and somebody will show you the word of God, what salvation is all about. They'll pray with you the prayer of salvation. If you're already saved, but you don't have a church home where you're growing and getting stronger, when you're being fed and being filled, and I want to invite you to join this church. Love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your church family. You can grow. Reach out to that number as well. If you need to be restored in right relationship, we want to pray restoration in your life. Come on, put your hands together right now. We're praising God for you, believing that you're moving forward by faith.